I'll just hand it over to Jim and John now to give us a quick introduction to themselves. Over to you guys. Jim, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah, my name is Jim Bertoft. I've been working with Imperva for a number of years now, uh, both on the CloudWAF side and the database side. And when we um, introduced the uh, advanced bot protection, I worked really closely with John to help share that out with the uh, with the CloudWAF users and working on the integration and the policies, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And my name is John Cosgrove. I came over with the acquisition of Distill Networks, where I previously led the sales engineering team. So I continue on here at Imperva as the senior product manager for the bot protection, as well as the client side protection too. Okay, that's great. Um, shall we kick off with a quick poll then to find out a little bit more about people here? That'd be great. Please do, Sarah. So everyone, there should be a little question in front of you there. If you wouldn't mind letting us know um, what ways you see that bot traffic can impact your site. Um, there's no right or wrong answer, or is there? <laughs> Just feel free to give your answers through here and we'll see what, what the different kind of responses that we get are. Um, so I'll let that run for a little longer. Remember, pop in your questions to the chat um, at any point. We have some um, questions that have been sent in ahead of the event, which is great. So we'll kick off with those in a moment once we've finished this poll. But like I say, we'd like to hear from the guys that are here at the moment. So do. Um, Send us through your questions. Really, folks, uh, looking to make sure we're providing good content, um, what you came for, as well as trying to understand where you all might be in your bot journey yourself. So um, as evident by the poll, there can be a lot of different uh, impacts. And, and we'll, we'll talk about some specifics here in a second. <laughs> Let's go 80-20 rule, 80-20 rule. <laughs> so I'm going to end the polling now, and then I'll share the results with you all. Yeah, um, let, I, I guess, let me just say, I mean, you're, you're, all, you're all right. Uh, the, there are all ways that bots, right? Just, just the word bots. If you just say the word bots to somebody in the cybersecurity space, they're going to have one of these ideas about what we're talking about. Um, so basically everybody that answered, um, you, you came at it from a good place, specifically DDoS being number one, abuse two, fraud number three, and vulnerability scanners number four, they're all affecting businesses in their own ways. For this webinar, Jim and I are here as subject matter experts for that second and that third um, answer. So abuse and fraud. And when we came up with this poll, we wanted to do it in a, in a very broad sense uh, because no two bot attacks are necessarily alike across different verticals. They're all um, motivated by different things. So Imperva has multiple products to help our customers uh, deal with these types of attacks, but the abusive things that bots can do, like uh, try to take over accounts with credential stuffing or try to uh, snatch up limited availability inventory like concert tickets and hot items like uh, PlayStations, Xboxes, and uh, graphics cards, right? Uh, that, that is kind of abuse of a website, and that's what we mean that's what we mean there by abuse. When you, when you go to fraud, you can think of account takeover or um, cashing out somebody's loyalty rewards points, something like that, right? Where if you can do that at scale, it's a very profitable operation for a bot operator to, to run. Whereas DDoS, way more straightforward and going to be a different attack vector. Uh, vulnerability scanners, yeah, sure, they're there, but um, we're, we're really trying to focus on the abuse and the fraud aspects of, of bot traffic in today's AMA. Yeah, John, and I think it's, it's important to note that we're, we're doing that because we use different techniques for each of these types of attacks, because a, a DDoS 
uh, attack is usually done by either legitimate traffic like login just overwhelming those resources or they're just sending a bunch of garbage traffic right half half open connections that type of thing and we can detect some of that garbage traffic with other techniques same thing with the vulnerability scanners and the exploits we know what those look like so we can look for those patterns and we can say hey if you're trying to do a sql injection we recognize that pattern we can stop it as opposed to some of the abuse and fraud where they're not really doing anything bad they're just doing what your customers would usually do so you can't stop it just based on the activity pattern and we have to look a little deeper great point jim that, that's exactly why this is a tough problem to solve with abuse and fraud they're they're just doing what normal customers do so how are you supposed to tell the difference john i will i will say we, we've got a, a couple customers that report they have problems with the chatbots coming in through their contact me pages and they'll they're basically marketing to the uh, to the internal staff or they're trying to spam the internal staff by going in through the contact me pages automatically and in that case we can help you with it yep, yep. maybe before some of the pre uh, questions that came in maybe we could also kind of pull the audience about that second poll question we had yeah for sure where, where everybody's where everybody's minds are at that should be it up my looks good So we should be seeing the results now, yeah? Yeah, this is great. This is really great. Thanks for thanks for your input, everybody. Um, these are definitely the top four cases that, that I see in the wild and that I think about when we're trying to iterate the product and, and make it better for all of our customers um, and our prospects that aren't customers yet. So um, the by far, by far, the number one thing I see in the press talking to prospects, talking to customers, is that credential stuffing and account takeover use case. Uh, so much of what we do today is locked up in an account online at a service and we're only human and so we're tempted to reuse these passwords for all of our sites. But when email is the username and one site gets breached, all of the, uh, the data in that breach just gets tried on a million other websites. And so uh, one breach at one site can, can lead to compromise in a bunch of other sites. But luckily, Imperva has the account takeover module as part of the advanced bot protection suite to protect you there. Um, and that is, it's a very purpose-built uh, piece of tech. And if you're not using it today um, and you're part of uh, the advanced bot protection product, you, you are entitled to it. So uh, talk with your account executive, your CSM, um, somebody here at Imperva to get that started for you because uh, we, we'd love to protect you from, from that aspect. Certainly we can get into some Q&A on those other three, the inventory abuse, carding, web scraping. Web scraping is super broad. I would love to know how that affects your businesses. Maybe. Um, if we have some time near the end of the AMA, this is obviously for you guys to ask us questions, not the other way around. So appreciate um, answering the polls and, and helping us out there. Okay, shall I kick off with some of the questions we received ahead of the, the session? Um, so just to kick off, um, there was a general question about what exactly are bots in, in terms of like, uh, as opposed to chat bots or advanced bots, what are the differences what, and how, how would you describe them? Yeah, and it's, it's really important. I think we kind of um, hit on what types of abuse we, we want to focus on in the session, but as well as like not all bots are created equal, right? I don't know how many Google searches I do a day, but obviously Google bot is something that crawls the web and, and fetches up information for us to then work with. And so they are considered necessarily a good bot. Um, and other search engines are out there just, just like them, whether it's DuckDuckGo or Bing or um, some of the non-US based search engines, they're on Imperva's known good bot list. And so our, our products to help against bot abuse are going to know that beforehand. And, and we're not trying to stop those bots or really manage those bots. The, the ways to really manage good bots are in each specific bots. Um, webmaster tools. So if you go into the Bing webmaster tools or the Google webmaster tools, you'll find ways um, to have them adjust their crawl rate to your site. And, and you don't need Imperva to do that. 
um, robots.txt. If, if bots are gonna um, have that and, and respect that, you don't need Imperva to, to write a good robots.txt file. But uh, we are you know, specifically concerned about anybody that's not a human and not a known good bot. Um, what are they trying to do on your site? Maybe it's completely benign, or maybe it's something more malicious. And we can talk about the different ways that um, I think one of the one of the pre can questions has like a how, you know what's success look like? How do we get started? What what should we do? And we can talk about um, the, the kind of the mile markers for that later on. Yeah, John, and I think it's uh, it's also interesting when we talk about the different types of bots. We had those attacks earlier that we mentioned the DDoS the um, uh, the exploit and we off, we use the word bot to de to describe an automated process and those are the the basic bots that we can kind of identify in a particular way the advanced bots when we're talking about they're running from a more um, a more capable platform that's where the challenge gets interesting Right, the ones that identify themselves for good or bad, right? Because uh, there's there's lots of good bots out there that, like uh, like you mentioned, Googlebot that identifies themselves. There are some bad bots out there that actually identify themselves, like a Nessus scanner or some of these um, exploits that we're able to identify pretty easily. And from the Imperva standpoint, the Imperva platform takes care of the easy ones automatically. When we get into the more advanced, capable platforms, that's where it, it gets more interesting. Yeah, and I see a good follow-up question in the chat. Natalie asked, what about the Google bots that don't use the Google bot user agent and come over Google proxy? Um, it reminds me, you have to be careful with fake Google bots. Uh, so Google bot crawls from a very specific set of, of Google properties and IP address ranges and the reverse DNS will always go back to them. Uh, and we do all that checking on our side so you don't have to. Um, Googlebot user agents coming from Googlebot IPs, say in GCP, are not the real Googlebot. And so that can be tough to, um, to manage on your own without a, a full-blown solution. So, it, I mean, if I saw, if I had a dollar for every WAF rule that I had that just saw like whitelist star Googlebot star, like it, uh, it's, it's, I do not recommend doing that because do that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you're going to let in a lot of impersonators that way. Yeah, the, the next question is really kind of dovetailing into that about bot protection versus security protection. And I think it goes well with the last answer and, and the abuse talk, right? Um, if you look at a traditional security tool like a web application firewall, they are operating on known signatures, known something wrong with this request coming into my site. And as Jim said earlier, the, the bots that are trying to um, perpetrate abuse and fraud, they, those requests are going to look exactly like a human request. So uh, you can have all the security protection that you can get and you can be doing all the security best practices, but the bot abuse that comes in and tries to take advantage of your business and take advantage of your business logic um, is going to bypass all of those because there is no SQL injection to key in on. There is no cross-site scripting signature to key in on. Uh, and, and that can be the difference between uh, thinking that you have a or, or having an actual great security posture, but still being open to abuse and, and fraud from, from bot operators. Of course, from a risk standpoint, you got to protect against all of it, both the uh, both the abuse, et cetera. But uh, being able to focus in on how do you tell the difference between the human doing the normal human things and the bot imitating the the bot things or the bot imitating the human things, which leads us into our next question. <laughs> yeah, maybe Jim, you could talk about uh, the the classical use of captchas and and IP reputation. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it was interesting, John, when you were talking about um, uh, some of the steps that people would take, right? That's always the thing. Somebody will, you know, you'll go to your management and you'll say, hey, we're getting a bunch of attacks 
from these IP addresses in these bad data centers. And your manager says, well, geez, why don't you just block those IPs? That's a, a pretty obvious solution. And of course, when you do block those IPs, then the bad guys just move to a different IP and now you can't identify them as easily because they're not coming from that list of bad IPs. Same thing with the CAPTCHA, right? You could say, hey, let's put a CAPTCHA in there to protect the site and only humans can solve CAPTCHAs, right? Well, that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got lots of different, the bad guys have lots of different ways to deal with CAPTCHAs. There are some CAPTCHAs that they can solve programmatically, and if not, they can send it out to a CAPTCHA farm. And so just putting that CAPTCHA on the web, uh, the CAPTCHA farm where, you know, people are sitting at the end of their computers getting ready to solve it for a couple pennies a piece, and if you can do enough in an hour, it makes it worthwhile. But from the bot guy, you're paying a couple bucks to have a thousand CAPTCHAs solved. And so while the CAPTCHA might slow them down a little bit or raise their cost incrementally, it's not a great solution. And like John mentioned, we wanna make sure that we have that depth of, uh, depth of tools because in some cases you can block certain bots and you can eliminate certain problems for yourself by taking some of these basic steps. But in some case, if you've got a determined attacker that's coming directly after you for some reason, then we've got to escalate a little, little bit escalate a little, a little bit and get into some of those more advanced techniques. Yeah, in terms of CAPTCHAs themselves, um, it's really kind of unfortunate the way that CAPTCHA use has played out across the internet, in my opinion. They're creating friction for real users. I mean, nobody likes to solve them and the bots are solving them easily. So I think to the question in the chat about CAPTCHAs and, and effectiveness of CAPTCHAs, one thing that I stress all the time is like, okay, I, I get it. Maybe during like a testing phase, you want to test the, the solution and use a CAPTCHA just in case. Like if there are false positives, you don't want real users to get that hard block message. They can complete the CAPTCHA, be on their way. I think that's great. But keep an eye on the CAPTCHA statistics. And advanced bot protection from Imperva can allow you to, to do that. You can see, okay, how many were served, how many were solved, and get an idea of, well, are real users impacted? And Imperva also allows you to customize the CAPTCHA page that a bot or a human might see. So uh, put your customer service contact information on there. Um, if somebody really isn't sure, or maybe they had a problem with the CAPTCHA, maybe there's, uh, gosh, who knows, right? Uh, and they call into customer service, uh, you you as the uh, administrator of the tool and the source of the capture are probably going to hear about it. So um, I would say the capture solution or captures are okay to use at first. But once you get a good idea of the efficacy of the platform, um, try to move off a of capture and into block and, and make sure you have that page customized to have a feedback loop. And throw things like Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics, whatever your analytics suite is, put that on your customized page as well. So you have a double check on, on everything uh, from, from that regard. So, uh, and I'm not sure about that question in the chat, how effective is the new Google CAPTCHA? Not sure which Google CAPTCHA you're specifically referring to. Um, if it's the invisible one, I, I've heard that it's, it's just not enterprise friendly. So you're not going to have the buttons and the knobs to tweak it if you need to. Um, it's just kind of like the Google saying, don't, don't worry. Uh, we know what's best. Um, we'll control everything. Don't worry about it at all. But in the background, you can still bypass it like reCAPTCHA does anyway. And I guess the last thing I'll mention about CAPTCHAs is, is that um, Imperva em employs a more hardened CAPTCHA. It's a little more expensive to solve. Uh, for the bot operators, as well as um, it can be easier for humans to, to solve too, instead of clicking traffic lights or cars or bicycles or crosswalks or mountains and hills and staircases and um, a little bit more user-friendly. Let me, let me take that one follow-up question um, from Natalie in the chat. It, moving from capture to block for friendly customers that are tending to scrape data for purchasing decisions, um, how do you prevent those humans from being blocked? I would urge you to deploy a specific API for that approach. And then we can get into API protection and that sort of thing. But when 
you deploy an API endpoint specifically for um, machines to consume, you can manage that with, with that in mind. You're no longer having to say, oh, well, I have to open myself up to abuse from customers and uh, malicious actors. I can have my bot protection solution. I can say on my block page, hey, by the way, if you need volumetric pricing data for whatever reason, get in touch with us. Uh, if, if it's the right use case, maybe you can even charge for it uh, as a business. Or if you just want to be friendly to, to some customers, um, put it under lock and key and, and throw it in an API gateway solution that has sensible rate limits um, for an individual user, right? Not somebody who's trying to scrape your entire product catalog um, for for uh, purchasing decisions. So it, it can get pretty complex. I think that's where, you know, a more in-depth conversation with us would, would be good. Um, but I, I did want to just throw that in there. Yeah, John. And I think, uh, it's, it's important as you're talking about, um, you've got, you've got endpoints that you access with web pages. You've got endpoints that you access with machines such as APIs, and you've got end, endpoints that you access with your mobile devices. And each of those takes a little bit different approach for how to handle those. Like John said, if you've got information that you know, um, some of your customers are gonna need to access programmatically, then setting that up through an API with some of those API controls, and Imperva can help you with some of those, um, is a great way to do it. And then uh, with the mobile, we obviously, if it's, you've got a mobile endpoint, they can kind of treat that like an API. And of course we've got the mobile SDK that can help you with that. So we can eliminate the actual mobile devices versus the automated calls that are trying to emulate that mobile device. But the web page itself in the browser is the, uh, the challenging bit, if you would. George asked about false positives um, with some privacy conscious customers. And we, we don't typically see customers changing their user agent on the fly like that. Uh, that's pretty indicative of bot behavior. Certainly there are uh, privacy conscious folks that block um, things like JavaScript trackers and third-party JavaScript, third-party cookies. In Perva's JavaScript component that interrogates the browser, looks for automation tools, like very clear signs of automation tools, as well as help builds a unique fingerprint to differentiate users and be um, very specific when we do block, instead of just blocking an IP like, like Jim mentioned earlier. Um, that JavaScript is first party and the cookies that we set are first party and we don't collect any PII with any of that. So rarely do we end up on say a, um, an ad block list or a, a privacy list. And if that user is disabling all JavaScript, there are a couple things um, that you can do. So, I mean, one, if your site itself uses JavaScript and, and completely breaks, if, if a user has JavaScript disabled, well then, then they can't really use your site and our, our security protection doesn't really matter in that regard. Um, if, they have blocked specifically our piece of JavaScript and they see a capture page or they see a, a block page, that again is where you can customize that message and say something to the effect of like, hey, look, if, if you have uh, a browser extension that blocks JavaScript, like um, you, should, you should allow it to continue to use our site. Um, so it's usually not a problem because we're first party in all those regards and, and we're not getting caught up in like the Safari tracking protection or, um, or anything like that. Like the Brave browser um, should be just fine. Yeah, and John, uh, I think to some extent, some of that question is coming, I think from some of the Cloud WAF users because inside of the Cloud WAF, we do have some rate limiting rules. We do have some uh, user agent checks that are more IP based. And when you're dealing with the IP based stuff, then yeah, you do have to make some allowances because you can have a bunch of legitimate users coming from the same IP. 
right? And that's why that's why we use the JavaScript to help distinguish those individual users, so that we can either you know rate limit them or identify them individually, as opposed to an IP address that could have you know hundreds of people, or if it's you know some kind of a Tor exit node, then who knows what's coming from there, good traffic or bad. That's why we want to focus on that individual. And like John said, explaining that to the customer, if if you say I'm going to open myself up to anybody coming from any location anywhere that doesn't have to run JavaScript, then yeah, your your detection capabilities are pretty limited <laughs> because you're letting anybody in. Yeah. Um, the uh, Brian asked a question about the JavaScript and the fingerprint, how are, how are they identified besides the IP address? And we're looking at about 200 different attributes of the JavaScript engine of, of the browser. So um, things like the WebGL uh, rendering, things like if there's a battery present on mobile devices um, to plugins and fonts, uh, screen resolutions that are supported, all of that stuff comes together in, and we picked it specifically because it's performant. So it doesn't bog down your web page, but it also has enough granularity to um, kind of pinpoint the needle in the haystack of the bad actors and take care of them while allowing the um, the, the good folks through. So, uh, you know, a specific list is kind of in the secret sauce area, uh, but I, I hope that answers your question, Brian. And I know Sebastian sent in a question beforehand that also asked about um, folks just turning off JavaScript in the browser. I, I hope the previous um, the the previous answer helped with that understanding too. Um, I think there there was another question coming in beforehand about. Uh, we've been talking about browsers a lot, right? And somebody asked about mobile applications and the approach for mobile traffic right now is with an extra SDK. So you do have to add our SDK to your mobile app, but once it's there, it's super lightweight. It does all the hard work for you. And then the APIs that your mobile apps, um, that your mobile apps communicate with can be protected by the solution uh, just like just like the web page. So, um, uh, Sarkis, I hope I hope that helps answer that question. Uh, John, um, real quick, another another question that we had had come in that I think kind of ties in with the JavaScript fingerprinting um, has to do with we we do have some JavaScript options in another part of the interface in the Cloud WAF that has to do with the client side, that's different from what we're talking about here. Cool. And then limitations to use the fingerprinting inside the account takeover module. Um, right now, the limitation is that we have to enable that on the back end. So it you can use it. Um, it's a little less granular right now if you don't, but if you're seeing um, some false positives in that regard, like we can enable that for you. Just send in a support ticket. Yeah, and for everybody on the call, the one of the goals of the ATO is a minimal impact. So when you, when you onboard that site, you're not interrupting the traffic flow unless you start enforcement. We're just doing extra analytics on it, as opposed to with the ABP, you can have the JavaScript injection, et cetera. With the, with the account takeover, it really is just analytics until you um, trigger that enforcement on the enforcement side. So uh, like John mentioned at the beginning, if you, if you have access to ATO and you aren't using it, feel free to, uh, to dig in and start playing around with it because until you click that enforcement button on ATO, you're not going to break anything. Yeah, same same with the general advanced bot protection suite too. Uh, we'll start collecting data, but you're not going to break stuff just by turning it on. 
Um, we did get a couple of sort of roadmap type questions, um, and I'm happy to answer those. Um, one was around accessing the, the advanced bot protection console without logging in to say the cloud WAF console. And um, that's not currently on the roadmap, like that uh, all in one user interface inside the Imperva console is, is definitely how we've got it um, set up on purpose. So if you're having issues there or something's not working for you, reach out um, and we can see what's going on. There were a couple other ones, things like writing to the audit log. Um, that is probably coming in the next few weeks. So I know it's a, a must-have feature for a lot of folks, and it's, it's uh, almost ready to ship. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, and, and just talking about the process in general, um, if, you're, if you're doing it yourself and you want some help uh, and you're kind of already entitled to ABP, we certainly have some professional services packages that can help get you started. And uh, we'd be happy to help with that. As far as um, if you're thinking about doing like a proof of concept or something, uh, one of uh, somebody like Jim can help you out like that with the account representative that you normally work with. As far as what a normal onboarding looks like, we typically try to maintain a laser focus for the first type, type of use case. So if you think back to the poll that we did and you know what is top of mind when you think about protecting your site, um, from this type of fraud and, and abuse. If it's something like account takeover, well, let's focus on that. Let's not onboard the whole site. Let's just onboard your login path. Let's use the account takeover module itself and make sure that you're seeing value and we're solving that problem for you. You might not even need to go into mitigation mode. You can just take a look at the graph and say, oh my goodness, uh, yes, I definitely have a problem. Let's take care of this. Uh, it, it can be as simple as that. But as, as far as an onboarding goes, um, if you have a fraud team, so like to, to the question that Kay mentioned, uh, if you have a fraud team that would feel the downstream effects, definitely get them involved and uh, tell them what you're doing. Tell them they should expect to see less or uh, when you're going to start blocking or get an idea from them what they deal with. Uh, and that can help you uh, socialize it inside the organization. And, uh, the, oh, go ahead, Jim. I was going to say, John, uh, since you mentioned the fraud team, um, we had talked a little bit about some of the actions that you can take. We, could, we talked about blocking. We talked about capturing. And I want to make sure everybody knows one of the other things that we can do with the Cloud WAF is forward some of that information as an X header. And so in working with the fraud team, we've kind of seen uh, some interest in if you if it's if it's definitely looks like bot activity, block it. But if you're not quite sure or you want to let it through for some reason, you can let it through and still append that information to the request. And then if you can grab that on the back end, it really helps when that fraud team says, boy, somebody initiated this transfer and I'm not sure if it was legit or not. Giving those X headers and uh, both from bot and from cloud WAF can give you some extra information because maybe the fact that it came from Estonia makes it a little bit more suspicious. Yeah, somewhere outside of where you're normally doing business. And the fact that maybe they didn't pass our JavaScript challenge. Right. Or uh, the fact that it is breaking a rate limit and we saw telltale signs of an automation framework being used in the browser. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, just the dead giveaways. Um, even if you're not ready to block, you can use and augment your existing tools at the origin today. Yep. I would definitely say um, understanding the scope of the project 
is is paramount. Like I, I see where I see folks have a really hard time is when they try to boil the ocean. And if you try to onboard the entire website and then you try to take action on all the bot traffic all at once across the entire site, um, it, you're going to have a bad time because different um, sections of your site are used differently. If you have a sign up API, a checkout API, an add to cart API, um, a balance check API, right? Like all of those things should be protected, but they might be used in slightly different ways. So they should probably have their own rate limits. Individual and abused, abused in slightly different ways too. Uh, exactly, exactly. So um, pick and have a laser focus on one, maybe two paths and have a metric where you can measure the um, measure the effectiveness. Like how, how do you know you have a problem today? Maybe you don't know you have a problem. Okay, talk to people in your organization, talk to your fraud team, um, like scope the project number one. Then I'd say the next milestone is getting traffic going. So like Jim said earlier, you can enable this stuff without taking any action. You can be in a monitor mode, be in alert mode. Then you can make the decision about whether or not to then protect that existing traffic that you just onboarded, or maybe you want to onboard your next use case and continue to monitor things. But scoping them out by path, by by target, if you will, um, is is definitely the way to go. The um, one of the other questions here, which I would say is is kind of part of onboarding, is once it's deployed, how do I monitor it? And we offer the ability to create custom dashboards inside of the user interface so that you see exactly what you need to see. Our default dashboards are like easy to use and they tell you information, but you can't save, say, like a set of filters on one dashboard. So it's better to go in, get your, you know, eight by eight panel of or that, that's a lot. Maybe maybe it's a you know a two by four panel of graphs that you care about to monitor those high value target paths and um, and, and keep an eye on it like that in the custom dashboard section. So so John, I'm going to take I'm going to uh, take a little bit different tact uh, from from the approach that, uh, that 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 you're talking about. Just because I know from working with some of my customers that we've got some customers that don't know what they have, right? Certainly. That, yeah, you know, they're not sure of the endpoints. They're not sure where the attacks are coming in. They don't even know what the path is necessarily because there's, you know, uh, the programmers are doing this and they're publishing it out and, you know, they know what the, the code is internally, but they don't know how that's represented on the website, et cetera. And that's where the onboarding for ABP comes in handy. Because like John said, you can turn it on, um, especially if you d uh, disable the JavaScript injection, right? Uh, now, obviously that limits what you can see, but what it does do is it lets you see the paths that are being hit. It lets you get some of the rate limiting information and it can help you identify either those hotspots or the endpoints. I've worked with customers where they say, you know what, we want to protect this site and we're not sure. We know that we're seeing a bunch of logins, but we don't know where they're coming from, right? And it turns out they had two different login endpoints. They had one that was an API-based endpoint and they had one that the web page was using. And being able to see that information in the ABP reports that identify, okay, here's the top URLs that have a whole bunch of hits. Right. And anytime you see a single URL path that has, you know, 10,000 requests coming from a single IP, that's something that you're probably going to be interested in. Right. Now, again, there, there, maybe there's a reason for it. Right. And you'll often find that there's some partner IPs that you may want to um, uh, add to your list before you start the enforcement. Right. And and we've seen that before, where especially if you have mobile APIs and web page APIs and um, API endpoints all on the same 
some sometimes on the same path, sometimes on the uh, on the same site. Being able to get that information first, and so uh, and and there's a difference again between the ATO and the ABP. With the ATO onboarding, it's really straightforward, and that goes back to what John said before about having that focused use case. That's one of the reasons why the ATO product is so successful and why people love it is because it is such a focused use case, right? It is just <laughs> login fraud. Right. And so uh, you configure that endpoint so that we can start seeing that traffic and recognizing successful logins and failed logins. And then the algorithms are already there. We already start classifying, do a little bit of checking to make sure you don't have an API endpoint or a partner that's, you know, doing a lot of accessing that you can then add to the list. And then you can start that enforcement. And so from the ATO perspective, that's pretty straightforward. With the ABP, if, like John said, if you know where your problem is and you know what that use case is of, hey, we're having a bunch of fraud on this endpoint, right? Like credit card stuffing. Everybody's trying to add a credit card and this is the call they're using to do that. If you know that, that's great. If you say, hey, periodically our web servers get overwhelmed with requests and we don't know where they're coming in from or why, then enable ABP without... Um, any of the enforcement with well, the default policy will will do just fine for you. And that lets you start getting that information into the reporting and into those dashboards. Those default dashboards are great for exploring the traffic, right? Once you know what's coming in and you want to keep an ID, uh, keep, a, keep an eye on very particular traffic, then the custom dashboard is great. But the default ones out of the box are great for exploring and kind of seeing what's going on and where those hotspots are. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Everybody's at a different place in their journey, whether you acknowledge your problem and you need to solve it immediately or whether you say, oh, man, yeah, uh, sometimes on Fridays, uh, our servers go down at five o'clock and we have no idea why. Um, right. And, and the visibility that different teams have is different. Uh, some people have a, a full SIM solution. And they can pinpoint exactly what went wrong. And other people um, simply get the page out and have to join the bridge and, and say, I'm sorry, but I don't know why it happened. So uh, it's kind of opposite ends of the spectrum there, but um, certainly everybody's in a different spot. I, I did see a question specifically about our use of Looker in inside the product. So Dennis, Dennis asked about that. Um, we will continue to use Looker. And you asked about reusing uh, saved looks, you should be able to go to one of your dashboards, open up one of your existing tiles or looks, and then click save to dashboard again. And then you can pick wherever you'd like to save it. So in that way, you can reuse those looks that you save. It, it should be possible. If you're having trouble with it, you know, send us a ticket. We'll get it ironed out. A, a quick question Wait. about ATO blocking non-bot malicious logons. So the challenge there, and, and this, this is part of, again, uh, the ATO, we're, we're trying to keep it uh, focused and uh, specific use. But one of the things that we do is we give you the ability to download compromised credentials and the ability to um, uh, download leaked credentials. So a leaked credential is something that... Um, has been published on the internet somewhere else, right? You know, hey, my name is admin and my username is password, right? Or, you know, something that I might have used, you know, Jay Bertoft is my username and I use password one, two, three. If I use User. it over here and they get compromised, they wanna check with you and see if you're, if, if I'm using it at the same location. So the leaked credentials is something that you want to be aware of. Now, they may not necessarily be malicious. It might just be that I use the same credential in five or six different places. But if the bad guys haven't found it yet, they will find it eventually. Because if Imperva can find it out there on the dark web, the bad guys can find it too. So identifying those leaked credentials. And again, you can pull this down with an API call to be able to get that list and maybe reset those usernames and passwords on the back end and basically say, hey, just give us another password, right? Hopefully one that's specific to us. And then the other one is those malicious, I'm sorry, the, um, the compromised credentials, where if we see 25 failed logins come in during a session and one successful one, it's pretty easy to identify those 25 failed logins as an account takeover, but that one successful one is the one you care about because it's the same guy sending all of those 
And clearly that's the one he got lucky on. And now he knows that username and password. He's the bad guy. We want to make sure that we grab that credential real quick and disable it, ask them to change the password, et cetera, because now we know that the bad guys know it. And you're right. They may come back not on an automated platform. It may pop up on somebody's screen and they say, hey, open this up in the browser, type this username and password in it. And it looks just like anybody else coming in. We have to grab that as part of the initial attack to identify it. And I... I placed a, a link to our documentation on ATO in the Zoom chat, and that goes over a bunch of different models or, or reasons, if you will, about why um, ATO would have picked up on a certain request being suspicious. So uh, in there are things like a suspicious number of users, um, even if they've logged in successfully. So if you wanna think about, well, non-bot malicious logins, uh, I've got a list of 50 usernames and passwords, and I'm going to log in manually over the course of a day and transfer out all the reward points to my Mule account um, and then spend them over there. Well, ATO could very well pick up on that because of the high amount of successful different users logged in from the same device. I know we're, we're running out of time here um, with our hour. If, yeah. if you post a question in the chat, we'll, we'll get it answered on community, regardless of whether we can answer it here in the session. So please, you know, kind of last call here for questions for the live event. Um, and if not, uh, Sarah, I'll, I'll kick it back to you. Just to reiterate, well, thanks for that, guys, for a start. That was really great to really appreciate all of your, your insights there. Um, and just to let the um, audience know, we will, post this a recording of this on um onto community and if there are any other questions that john and jim haven't got around to answering we'll make sure we post those along with the um with the recording so that we make sure we we cover everything i would just like to reiterate what Kay said as well if there's any sort of use cases or any content that you think would be useful for you and um, to help you get the most out of your Imperva products please do feed it back to us we want to hear about it we want to keep creating content that that makes your life easier basically so um do keep in touch with us on community um and and keep feeding back your your thoughts and ideas and um successful tips that you've had that you've found out through using your own products we love to see it on there okay in regard to the suggestion to scope out by path or target does that mean try handling a certain condition one at a time for all of the sites on your account um uh, tim thanks for the question i don't necessarily know if i'm understanding it the right way i'll try to answer it two different ways if you have a bunch of sites on your accounts that have the same structure and that's the um, thing that you want to protect let's just let's say it's your checkout path and you're selling something really valuable maybe you have the hottest sneakers out there and uh but you have a bunch of different brands but it's the same back end serving up the same checkout path under a bunch of different dot coms well you can group all those sites together and then administer that checkout path protection as one policy inside the tool. So it's really flexible with that regard. If you mean, if your question was directed kind of in a, a different sense, and you're talking specifically about the conditions itself themselves inside the, the tool, um, the editor allows a bunch of different conditions on the same policy. So I'm not sure if there was confusion there. Um, yeah, John, I think um, in uh, with some customers, we've seen them say, hey, we've got, you know, 10 different conditions and we can turn them on one at a time to kind of test the eff efficacy of each uh -huh. one. The challenge with that is I've, I've literally been on the call with customers, right, where you turn on, OK, block bad user agents, um, bot traffic drops, you know, immediately and then within minutes it's back up again because they figured out that they're going to you know get around the bad user agents say okay now i'm going to start blocking known violator data centers and traffic will block drop off all of a sudden and then pull back up so um we usually want to see those kind of turned on in a in a group so that they don't necessarily know what the individual problem is but this is also information that you can pull from the back end reporting right because we'll have multiple flags 
uh, maybe not, you know, not, not, not in the condition, but you can see those flags and identify, okay, here's usually a spectrum of flags that identify this bad traffic. And the automation is the big one, right? When you get to the point that you can enforce that JavaScript running and then look for the automation, that's where you're going to catch a lot of them. Yeah, thanks. That that makes much more sense now. Um, I recommend a, a very turn them all on. One, once you've got an idea for impact from false positives, uh, you can look at any traffic that's triggering any individual condition with the dashboards. And if you feel good about the false positive aspect, then there's no reason not to turn them all on because otherwise you're just kind of leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for the bot operators to rework their software and get around the system. There's one more question. Do you guys think you could take it? Briefly, um, could we use another information, not just IP, to identify the device if we use only ATO and not ABP? Uh, yeah, it should be possible. Submit a support ticket, and I think we can turn that on in the back end for you. Well, I think that's us for now. Thank you again, John and Jim, and thank you, everyone, for your time and for attending. Um, and, yeah, keep an eye out on community for the recording of this session.